Hi everyone, this is Coming to Peace with Science, and I'm Daryl Falk. This is part three of a series which began by examining the rate of change in genes and demonstrating how this suggests very strongly that God created humankind through the evolutionary process. The evidence we examined in part one and part two implies that humans and chimpanzees are each derived from the same ancestral ape species, one which existed between five and ten million years ago. In this video, we will explore in overview form how God used the evolutionary process to bring our species into existence. As we do so, we'll also examine whether this mechanism is consistent with what we learn about the nature of our Creator through Scripture. The answer that emerges, I think, will be as surprising as it is engaging, and I can't wait to think with you about it. In Psalm 8, we read, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is humankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. How, using evolution, did God make us a little lower than the angels? And is there a contradiction between the mechanism by which the evolutionary process operates and the very nature and character of God? As we begin, I want to say a few words about the way in which the evolutionary process is often misunderstood. The phrase survival of the fittest is not an accurate description of what happens in evolution. Let's examine that first word, survival. Evolutionary success is defined by the relative number of offspring, the relative number of fertile offspring, actually. And we might think of it like this. It's family size, not survival, that is important in defining evolutionary success. Second, let's examine the fourth word in the phrase survival of the fittest. Evolutionary change is not a function of fitness as most of us think of fitness. We think of physical properties when we think of fitness. We think of qualities like strength and virility and endurance and perhaps even aggressiveness. And we don't think of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yet, if these traits led to a larger number of offspring in our lineage, then the genetic makeup which gave rise to those traits would be associated with higher fitness. Fitness, in the evolutionary sense, is simply that which leads to a larger number of offspring. Evolutionary success leads to a set of traits which make a species well adapted to the environment in which it lives. But the environment may change over time. The beauty of the evolutionary process is that as the environment changes, the genetic properties of a species may also change, equipping individuals so that they may be better adapted to thrive in that altered environment. In our lineage, going back four to five million years, our ancestors were well adapted for life in both the trees and the ground. They were fully bipedal, but they had long fingers and they had arms that made them adept at moving into the trees to escape from predators. During this time, though, the environment was changing. It was becoming drier and jungle was becoming less abundant. This resulted in a greater prevalence of the more open grasslands and savannas. As our genus Homo emerged about two and a half million years ago, the climate was in a state of flux, which meant that in any particular geographical location, the habitat would frequently change. So not only was there an advantage to becoming well adapted to life on the ground and not the trees, but the high state of environmental fluctuation likely favored a flexible lifestyle. Indeed, scholars agree there was a significant advantage to genes which led to traits that encouraged flexibility. Augustin Fuentes goes one step further saying that this flexibility led to the hallmark of our species, creativity. Even though the habitat was fluctuating at any given location throughout this time period, our ancestors lived largely in savanna and grassland habitats, environments which provided less shelter than did the earlier existence in the jungle. It was dangerous in those more open environments, and our ancestors were highly vulnerable. They had no claws, no fangs, no horns, and they, compared to many of their predators, were not fast on their feet. But they did have one remarkable set of qualities. They were highly social creatures with increasingly social brains. In short, the one thing they had going for them was each other, their collective mind, and their growing ingenuity. Scholars believe they lived in small groups consisting of perhaps 15 to 25 individuals. They also probably operated, albeit more loosely, within a wider sphere of perhaps 100 to 200 individuals. Their diet was diverse. It consisted of fruits, nuts, plant stems, tubers, and some meat. The meat was largely obtained through scavenging at the start, but eventually, as their 
stone tools improved, they worked together to bring down their own prey. As Harvard scholar Daniel Lieberman states, the first hunter-gatherers would have benefited so strongly from sharing food that it is hard to imagine how they could have survived without males and females provisioning each other and cooperating in other ways. Food sharing, moreover, does not occur just between mates and between parents and offspring, but also between members of a group, highlighting the importance of intense cooperation between hunter-gatherers. Agustin Fuentes focuses on the community aspects of the scavenging mode of life that preceded hunting. Using their sharp stone tools to remove large chunks of meat and bone take back to their sleeping place, they would form a collaborative group. Some, he suggests, would strip the carcass while others stood guard shooing away the vultures and other small predators that were competing to scavenge the kill. Still others, he surmises, would watch the horizon, making sure that no large predators were approaching. All the while, this would have involved communicating with each other with grunts and gestures, reassuring and bonding, creating new levels of teamwork. There is much more to be said about this. The point is that in a small group where individuals know each other and survival is at stake, there is much value in being perceived as trustworthy and much disadvantage as being perceived as overly self-centered. That being the case, the frequency of genes which help build a community spirit would be expected to increase in the population, while the frequency of genes which led to antisocial behavior would decrease. There were, scholars believe, at least hundreds of small populations over those hundreds of thousands of years, and most of those little populations died out. The groups which thrived, on the other hand, consisted not in the meanest or the most cunning individuals. There is no evidence to support that. They were the ones where cooperation with each other was the secret to their success. In order to thrive in these little groups, fitness, in the evolutionary sense, may well have been grounded in principles not unlike the fruits of the spirit that we discussed earlier. In part four of this series, we'll begin to examine the evidence that it was compassion and cooperativity that led to our uniqueness as a species, and we'll continue to work our way towards a discussion of how all of this is a manifestation of the hovering Spirit of God at work in the creative process. After all, it is in Him that we long ago came to live and move and have our being. Indeed, as Paul said so eloquently before the Athenian scholars 2,000 years ago, we are His very offspring. To receive notification of that next video, please click on the subscribe button and don't forget to click on the little bell beside it.